6 Alpha Hotel. Today we are talking about radio as it appears in TV and film. This is episode number 92. Today I'm joined by my esteemed colleagues, David W0DHG, Scott NR, uh, I'm sorry, K KM6RFB, and Liana, special special co-host. Uh, Liana is uh, N6WH. And today we're going to just get right into today's topic. Let me switch over to the slide. There we are, 92. And we're going to jump into the checkout. David, if you can pull the folks down, I'm going to jump over to my walk up here in just a second. If you have access to WinLink, send us a WinLink check-in. Send it to all four of our normal call signs, W0DHG, NR6V, KM6RFB, W6AH, and our tactical address, Wave Talkers. The check-in, uh, the, the question for today is, what is your favorite TV or film scene that uses radio communications? So let's quickly jump over to our walk-up and we'll walk through the process of sending in that WinLink check-in bring my mic over here with me so you can still hear me as I'm moving over here to talk. All right, so here we've got our copy of WinLink set up. And what you wanna do is you wanna just come up here to the new message button, go ahead and click on that. You're gonna come here at the top of the toolbar, you're gonna to find the select template option. Go ahead and give that a click. And then inside of the templates, you wanna give a click to standard templates. Come down here to the general forms, give that a click. And we're going to come down here to the check-in, the winlink check-in.txt. Go ahead and give that a double click. If the demo gods are with you, it should open up in your web browser of choice. Up at the top of the screen, you want to make sure that you click on the field for date and time. That's going to set the form's date and time field to exactly your computer's current date and time. It's real important to make sure that you appear uh, on maps and in the correct sequence. Here's the, the two section. This is where you want to add all of our call signs in here. W6AH, W0DHG, and our 6 v KM6RFB, and our tactical address, Wave Talkers. In the from section, go ahead and put in your call sign. Station contact is going to be your name. If there are any other operators sitting there watching the show with you, go ahead and let us know what their call signs are as well. This is going to be an exercise, and for the service type, let us know if you're sending in your traffic via amateur radio or via shares. You can let us know what band you're sending it in. If you're just using the internet, go ahead and send that to Telnet. Or if you're using an RF sequence, go ahead and select which version of RF you're going to be using there. HF, VHF, UHF, SH, HF, SH, yeah. <laughs> SHF, there we go. Uh, for the session type, uh, you're going to let us know how you're sending that traffic in. If you're watching this still on YouTube later in the week or, or time shifted, go ahead and still send us a WinLink check-in. We love to see them and track all of those that do come in. Here's your location information. You're going to want to go ahead and let us know where you're sending in your traffic from. Your latitude and longitude should automatically be filled in here for you uh, based either on the center of your grid square, which you set up when you signed up for WinLink, or if you've got a GPS connected, it will have your more accurate, uh, more precise GPS coordinates. Here's that comment section. This is where you want to let us know what your favorite TV film scene is that uses radio communication. When you're all finished filling all that out, hit the submit button. You'll get a couple little pop-ups here inside of your browser. Just click OK. Those things go away when you do that. Once your browser window is clear, then go ahead and close that and you should see your WinLink message all fully populated with all of the text. Go ahead and press the post to outbox button here in the upper left. And at that point, you should see your outbox increment to a number one where you've got one item waiting there. You're going to come over here to the session type. Make sure you select the type of connection you're going to use. I'm just going to go ahead and use Telnet here on the Internet. And I'm going to hit open session and then hit the start button and the connection should just roll through. Look at that. We've got check ins coming in from all over the world. Uh, later on in the show, we'll check back here and map all of these check ins for where they're coming in from around the world. But in the meantime, let's get back to today's topic, and that is radio in TV and film. So the first, what we're going to do is we're going to walk through a couple of select 
uh, sequences that we've gone ahead and we've pulled out to to identify some of the content that has been uh, some of the ways that radio communication is being portrayed uh, via Hollywood. And we're going to have a look at it and we're going to try and see, is this uh, is this accurate? Is it inaccurate? What would it take to make it accurate uh, to make it so that these sorts of things would work? Or is it just completely out there uh, and out of the way? So the first one that I want to start off with here, let me jump back to the slides. And I'm going to also bring Liana up because, Liana, I want you to kind of walk us through this first this first uh, sequence here. So let me uh, let me click here through and you can uh, go ahead and introduce that one. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, yep, we hear everybody. You. Um, uh, wanted to walk through uh, Monarch, Monarch Legacy of Monsters, one of the mo more recent shows that I've been watching. I don't know if anybody else is watching it. Uh, just describe a little bit of the premise before we look at some of the slides um, is there is a, an invasion of these monsters, these prehistoric monsters um, at different places throughout the world. And there are a couple of organizations trying to track down when they might happen again, where they're happening. And so they've got a lot of technology involved. And so they're doing things where they're uh, checking for radiation flares and vibrations. And so there's a lot of technology and equipment in this, in this world they've created. And before I continue, also, I mean, everybody can agree here that TV and movies are meant to create worlds and they have the ability to create whatever conditions they want. They don't always do a good job of meeting those conditions. So as you know, if like one condition is not met, it could render everything else after that related to whatever that is, like the technology in this instance, we're talking about radio, debatable. That said, this TV and movies, that's what we love about them, right? They make the impossible possible. So this is meant to be a little bit fun, but also, like some of it's just, you know, it takes me out of it sometimes, as I'm sure it does you. I'm watching Legacy, Monarch Legacy of Monsters, and there's a scene about halfway through the season. And Chris, if you want to go to the next slide. There is a, she, this person is a, we find out later that she is a doctor, a, a science, doctor of science, and she works for a particular organization, one of the main organizations in the, in, in the show. And she's out in, I think the Utah desert is what they specifically say. And she's got this trailer and a few, uh, and she's just, she's relaxing, but her job again is to, they've sent her there because it's one of the areas where they think that there potentially is a lot of activity, activity or there will be a spike in activity in that particular location where one of these monsters, Godzilla, potentially could appear and Titans and these other like very, um, very cool, like gigantic prehistoric monsters. So she's there because it's one of the areas of interest. But so while she's there, if you notice, she's set up just hanging out, she's tanning, but she's got a couple of dishes up, which has got satellite and on top of her trailer, she's also got a radio. And so she's she's got equipment and she, she knows how to use it. And we'll see in a second once we get into the slide. And again, mentioning how the worlds are set up in a way like, you know, this is meant to set up, like she knows what she's doing. She has the equipment that she needs. And it's like, great, this is awesome. What are we gonna see? And when she gets a sense of activity from the outside, she, the, the picture that you just saw of her, she was sitting up because she heard, heard or felt something, a vibration in the air. So her, her attention is peaked. She runs inside of the trailer. And in this scene, um, she's inside the trailer. And she, she's, it's kind of dark, but you can see she's kind of racked there. You can make out some equipment. Um, and she's going through kind of checking monitors, checking screens. She's like, oh, yeah, and I'm noticing, I'm noticing something. Um, and again, based on this world, we can see that, you know, she, okay, she, she's looking for a lot of different things. So the thing that she does next is she goes over and she's got all this equipment laid out in the, in the, in the trailer. And so she goes to another area of the trailer, uh, where she's got some other equipment stored. And you can see the rack there to the little bit to the left. And you see her pick up a piece of equipment that just so happens to be like the only piece of equipment that's plugged in. Again, this is what I love about TV movies. It just happens to be the one she needs and it's plugged in. Um, and you can see that underneath and she's looking at it and she obviously sees something. And so what we don't see, or we're not gonna see in the next slide is she pulls it out. She, she notices something, pulls it out and now she wants to compare it to some other data that she's seeing. Um, and so she'll unplug it. She'll take it over to the rack that we see on the left and she'll take a look at, you know, she'll start to compare everything. 
she realizes immediately that what she needs to do is she needs to call her superiors who are back at some base camp somewhere in the world. And they're in a, it's, you know, it's a whole control room. It's mission control. looks like, uh, you know, NASA mission control. They've got screens. They've got monitors. They're monitoring all these places. You can see all these different screens. And what she does, I have, I have to notify them immediately. There's an event that's about to happen. So what does she do? She runs over. She picks up what looks like, at first, it's, you think it's just a phone, like a cell phone. Okay, that's fine. The way that she opens it, I don't know if anybody's familiar with a cell phone, a, a satellite phone. Many of them work the same. I should have brought an example. But immediately upon her opening the sat phone or, or um, initiating it, she extends the antenna. So immediately I'm like, okay, this is a sat phone. And so immediately I'm like, dang it. Why do I have to know anything about radio? I'm loving this show so much. And she opened her sat phone inside of the trailer and, and she dials and like half a second later, she's talking on, talking on the sat phone. All right, I liked this doctor and I liked this show. Now, dang it, all she had to do was, well, I guess that's what we'll talk about. Um, as many of you may or may not know, um, and I don't know how we want to do this, and everybody here is you know, familiar with radio and concepts and how signals work and that kind of thing. So uh, the questions I'm about to ask are just to engage, so please, I hope nobody's offended by some of the simplicity in it. But uh, does anybody is anybody familiar with how sat phones work? Um, for the most part, like I assume, typically a sat phone is meant to work by line of sight, by line of satellite. So for her to be inside of the trailer and it's not connected to the the dish that we saw on her roof because there's no cord, we see that. I mean, I guess we can suspend belief and say, okay, maybe it's connected by Bluetooth, that's stretching. But she would need to be connected to that satellite dish on top of the, um, the, uh, the trailer there or she could simply walk outside. Um, so one of the things that we need for satellite communications is line of sight. Oh, great, thanks. Monitoring chat, sorry. Um, so monitor, uh, sorry, monitoring uh, is line of sight. And so to be able to do that, one or two things. She could have either connected via an antenna inside of the trailer to the, to the one on the roof, and that would have been believable. Uh, she still would have needed to wait for the phone to acquire satellite, so that's number two. It needs once uh, it needs to, she needs to be in a position to be able to receive that satellite. That's still number one. In order to make that work, if she wasn't inside the trailer, the way she's using it, she could have gone outside. Same thing though. It's line of sight, so she's got to put the antenna up. It's got to acquire that satellite signal, and then she can dial and talk on it. It can't be an immediate thing, which is what happened in this instance. Um, and so. After that, she does a lot of really other cool stuff in the show. And this is the only instance where we see her do this. And I understand why they did it. And I guess that's part of the discussion, too, is, of course, we understand why they did it, right? They had to be super dramatic, and she had to be doing this act action like right away. It's so urgent she has to do it right away. I also, though, don't understand. Um, I mean, okay. I, the other thing is this set. It, this is set. I should have started with this. This is actually set in, I think she was 19... 86 or somewhere around. I can't remember what the date is. So the way this show works is there's time shifts. There's present day, uh, there's 1940s, 1950s, and then um, sometimes in the 70s, but a lot of it's present day. So this would have, I think she was set 1986 or 1992. I don't know why I'm remembering those two. Um, but here's one of the instances in one of those shows that I saw. Again, so if you haven't seen the show, if you like kind of monster stuff, it's actually really kind of fun. Um, but yeah, so, and I don't know how you want to proceed here, Chris. I don't know if, yes, or believe, as Ernie says, or believe in magic, right? Or believe which, in magic, again, yeah. Right, which, again, to me, I mean, that's one of the things I like about movies. But some some shows do a really good job of world building, and some of them kind of don't. They'll do a great job in world building around, say, the monsters, but then the little details are the areas where they just kind of go, eh, well, nobody will know, or nobody will care. As I've been diving into the the detailed shots, I'm going to go back a couple of a couple of shots here, so we can see where she's she's first here with the rack, kind of go forward a little bit, and when you're when you're in a close up of this particular uh, frame, uh, you can see. Let me see which mouse am I looking at? Over here, there's uh, right here in this spot of the rack, and actually you can see it a little bit better in the previous shot. There we are. Um, here in the rack, you can see uh, you've got a, a network uh, switch or router. It's probably a 24-port switch with absolutely nothing plugged into it. 
Over here in the rack, she's got a 48-port uh, network switch, also in the rack. And uh, a lot of the equipment, you're trying to kind of piece together kind of what details that you're seeing here. Up at the top, this uh, the top bar with the, the two knobs that are sticking here like that, that's actually uh, a light. Uh, those knobs would pull out and they would light up and illuminate the rack here. Uh, and she's got some other equipment that's just kind of lit up here. It it just fascinated me that here she pulls out this box, as Liana was describing, that is the, the key to what she's detecting. There is the power cord. It is the one thing that's plugged in. But what is it detecting and how would it be detecting? It must have – it's not connected to any of the rest of the trailer's antenna system, so it must – it must only use an internal antenna or some other internal sensors. And as as Liana was pointing out, one of the one of the challenges with the sat phone here is that she is inside of a Faraday cage. She is inside of a metal box that's not going to allow radio signals to be transmitting in through that range. So the the sensor that must be picking up some kind of some kind of sensors more than likely not going to be um, not going to be picking up anything that you would need to get the outside antenna for. Um, anyway, just lots of little details. And and this this whole idea for this episode really came from Liana. as She's like, hey, let's try and do something that would be really fun to to tease some of these things apart. So let me jump over to the next sequence. I'm going to pull Liana down for just a second. And we're going to jump into the next sequence. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Look at that. Um, the next one is from MASH. And this is from episode uh, season three, episode 11, uh, where they're talking about Adam's ribs is the title of this one. This one's available on Hulu if you want to be able to, to watch this episode. Uh, the last one is available on Apple TV Plus uh, if you wanted to watch that sequence as well. So let me do a little setup of what MASH Season 3, Episode 11 is. So uh, the guys have been uh, in the 4077, have been having the same meals for many, many days in a row. And uh, Hawkeye uh, goes a little bit crazy here. And he decides he really needs some Adam's ribs from Chicago. So what he does is he wakes up in the middle of the night and he goes and he gets radar, the radio operator for the base there, uh, for for the unit. And he, he wakes him up and he's like, radar, you got to make a phone call, man. You got to call in. I got to order these ribs. I got to get I got to get some ribs here into into Korea. So radar this this whole sequence, he is setting up a phone patch. He's the radio operator. And out of a dead sleep, Radar runs in. The very first thing he does is he grabs his notebooks because he knows he's going to need to start taking notes as he's doing this, following through the sequence of establishing this radio connection uh, across the world as he's going to do this. The next thing he does is he grabs his headset and he starts booting up his radio, turns the radio on, gets everything kind of fired up, ready to go. That is uh, pretty standard. He does this very, uh, very calmly while Hawkeye's going on and talking to him. And Radar is just going through the sequence of making sure his station is ready to be operational. Now, he calls his buddy sparky on on the line and if you're if you're familiar with the show this is usually who radar reaches out to first to start establishing some connections and he's doing this um completely over the radio making that making that hf connection uh he calls in he calls into sparky and tells sparky right away he's like hey i need you to, to set up a phone patch for me and i need you to get me jump to go to tokyo then go to honolulu and then get me into San Francisco, get me into an operator there so that I can, I, I'm ultimately going to work on trying to get myself into Chicago. So Sparky is going to take that information. He's going to do that, do those hops, uh, doing the phone patch for radar where he's connecting the radio uh, into the phone system and then using the operators who are in the phone system in order to leapfrog across the world. This is a pretty uh, pretty common thing. It's done in the in the Mars setup. It used to be pretty common in amateur radio as well. It's not so common uh, anymore, but it it does still take place. 
So as soon as Sparky comes back, and he comes back very quickly saying, hey, I've got your connection. I've got San Francisco for you. Radar takes his headset off. He picks up the telephone and he begins talking. Now, one of the first things he lets the audience know as he's talking in on this phone patch, he starts yelling into the phone because he's trying to tell the operator, hey, I'm on a phone patch. It's really hard for me to be able to hear you and I need you to speak up. I need you to speak louder. Now, I, I've been on a phone patch. I had uh, somebody who was sailing uh, across the Pacific Ocean and my cell phone rang and I'm like, what, what is this that I, you know, I picked up the phone and it was actually an operator in Texas who had established an HF phone patch uh, with this ship that was out at sea. And I was able to have that conversation. It really is, you really do need to, to kind of yell into the, in, into the phone a little bit in order to get that communication. You do hear the static, you hear the communication that's going back and forth. It works, it works remarkably well, but it is a little bit difficult to hear. And this is a really pretty accurate uh, portrayal of this that, uh, that Radar does here as he's establishing the connection. What kind of fails from there is as soon as he gets all the way into Chicago, he hands the mic, he hands the phone over to Hawkeye, who then casually begins charming the other side to be able to talk and to be able to, to convey what he needs to do in order to get these Adam's ribs. Now, as he's doing this, Radar, like a good operator, immediately is taking notes. Now, if you've ever operated net control, you know how critical this is and how helpful this is to have a scribe sitting next to you to be taking accurate notes, listening in on the conversation, and being able to follow through for you. Um, the, the next part of the sequence here is where... Uh, where the uh, they're continuing to place the order, and now Hawkeye is really interested in making sure that he can get uh, get these ribs all, all the way in here. Uh, Radar's clearly just exhausted at this point, and uh, uh, he does get through the entire thing. So, with this whole sequence, while there's some creative license that's taking place with making sure that the storyline moves forward. The sequence is actually pretty accurate from from what my own experience is and from what that I've seen of other operators for how a phone patch would work. It's just not as common these days as it used to be, although in certain uh, realms within amateur radio and certainly within emergency communication, having phone patch equipment uh, so that you are able to do this. Basically, what you're doing is you're taking the radio and you're putting it in a Vox mode. You're connecting it um, via an analog patch into the phone system. And then when the two op when the two um, uh, speakers are talking back and forth, it's going through this patch and it's allowing the communication to be sent over HF. One of the things that you do have to get into a little bit where this is not quite so accurate is there ends up being a defined rhythm to your conversation when you're talking on a phone patch, which is very similar to when you're having a conversation over the radio. It's not it's not full duplex, so you do have to speak, wait a little bit for the other person to respond, and you have to wait for the radio to kind of go back and forth. So you get into this pattern of kind of waiting a little bit more, and that's where they're just taking the creative license to be able to drive forward to make it feel like it's a real phone conversation at this point. So that's the walkthrough of the MASH sequence. Uh, David, Let's talk about the next one. Let me bring you up to screen. All right, and let me unmute. And uh, how I wish we could play this clip for you because this is just one of the most classic comedy sequences uh, ever seen in a movie that I remember, you know, in the 1980s when this when this movie came out. Um, who th who would have thought that having, you know, three folks in a in a cockpit one guy named Victor, one guy named Clarence, and then someone named uh, Captain Over would create a problem. But as the uh, they ask for uh, for takeoff, um, you know, somebody says Roger, and guess what? One of the guys' first name is Roger, so he says, "Huh?" And uh, and then it goes on to um, um, asking for uh, departure information, and he says Roger, and he says "Huh?" again, 
And uh, and then they ask for a vector, and the guy in the back who's Victor says, "What?" And uh, and back and forth they go, and then they get to do we we have clearance, clearance, right? How 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 could you come up with a worse set of names to illustrate just the funniest communication back and forth between these three guys? And uh, you know the likes of these comedic legends that you see on the screen there really pull it pull it off. They really make it work. I only wish that this had gone on longer and back and forth and that we could play the clip. And it really illustrates why um, clear language is so important what you do as a radio communicator. And they were super clear in their radio communication. That's kind of the funniest part of this bit. And, you know, as a, as a teenager before I was a radio operator, I didn't get I got why it was funny because it was all the names and they kept going, huh, and what, and huh. And and as an adult, as a radio operator, going back and watching this, and if you stick around in the uh, in the uh, after meeting, we'll, we'll, we'll play this for you, actually. It is just so comedic, so they keep, you know, hearing their name and their what, and they're that, and back and forth. And, you know, how do you fix this in the real world? And, you know, I've thought about this since we started talking about this earlier in the week. It is really difficult to figure out how if your name is over and you say over and they're thinking, oh, are you calling me or you're saying you're done on the radio? Or if, you know, you're you're saying Roger because you're acknowledging someone, but your name is Roger and you're thinking, are they calling me or they're just saying they're done or they're, you know, it, it's um, it is a difficult thing. I think in some ways they beat us to the punch by giving us call signs, right? And they didn't realize what a, what a great service they were doing because nobody's going to, you know, mess up or, or assume that when somebody calls W0DHG or W6AH or W6WH or KM6RFB, nobody's going to get that confused with some other you know information that they're trying to go. It's very clear. I'm calling me. I'm calling Chris. I'm calling Liana. I'm calling Scott. Um, that part helps fix that a lot. And then, and then it's just a matter of making sure as you speak, you speak purposely um, uh, with intention. And, you know, I always try to rem remind my operators in the MCOM world, Please speak at writing speed because when it's important and you need to write the information down, if you're talking really fast, nobody's going to be able to capture anything you're going to say. And it's just going to go out one ear and in the other. And you're going to have a lot of fills and you can ask people over and over again with, what is it that you were trying to get across? Because it doesn't work that way. And again, I really wish we could show you these, this clip uh, without getting a takedown, but that is about as best we're going to be able to do today. Thanks so much, David. Uh, nice walkthrough on that. Uh, the next sequence that we're going to talk about comes from Jurassic Park. And uh, Liana, let's go back over to you for uh, for the walkthrough on this sequence. Okay. Um, one of the fun things, I, I obviously like these prehistoric animal movies or monster movies now. Thanks for letting me do Jurassic Park. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, Jurassic Park is just it was based on the, the there being Jurassic creatures in modern day, um, and there are scientists um, studying them. I'm trying to be very just brief about the description if you haven't seen it. Uh, anyways, and there's a series of them. They're very fun, very action packed, um, and again, great, great, great job of building a world where these creatures exist. Uh, and one of the things that happens. Um, into the first movie towards the end is they're at a point now or now through the, the crux of the film and they're trying to uh, be able to resolve an issue with a lot of these uh, dinosaurs coming down on them. And uh, there's, there's a couple of different characters. There's about four characters total. Um, and what they've had to do is they've uh, had to run into a bunker. So the bunker is, uh, built into the ground and then it goes underground because they take steps. And again, remember this is a, a concrete bunker that they've got into. And the way the scene plays out is that the main characters, they go into this bunker um, and they, they're they trying to figure out their plan. Like, okay, one of the guys says, I'm the only one that can guide you through how to do this. And the character that you're seeing now, she says, great, I will go. Um, and he says, well, you can't go, and there's other characters that, that they're not available to go, so she's the one that needs to go. So while they're doing their planning, before this scene, she looks over as they're talking. She says, I'll grab a radio. She looks over a radio. She goes over to a bank of radios that are charging um, in this bunker, and she grabs one out. And it's just, it's a it's an HT. 
Um, and the gentleman who's going to walk her through everything says, great, we can talk on the radio and I'll guide you through everything. So the first thing she has to do is she goes up outside of this bunker and then she's outside and she's talking. Okay, that's potentially believable if, again, if there was a scenario where there was uh, some kind of connection between the radio and an external tower to be able to continue those communications. Uh, and while she's outside, they're still talking. And what you see here is finally, once they get chased from the outside back into a bunker, she actually heads into a completely different bunker that's also concrete and also underground. And so as soon as she hits the bunker, um, she gets on the radio and she says, hey, you know, th this is what's going on. Now I'm in this, now I'm in the place that I need to be. Um, and so, you know, as we were talking about before, just being able to create the, the scenario where that exists, we don't see anything that exists that makes that possible. There isn't anything inside, like there's repeaters or there's any kind of like um, anything to help elevate that signal or even make that signal possible. So again, she goes deeper into the bunker. Um, and again, they, they're just continuing to talk over the radio like, uh, and it's very clear, that's the other thing. So this is the gentleman who's guiding her through everything that she needs to do. And um, again, deep inside this bunker and he's on the HD. I don't, there's not a ton else to explain here other than it's kind of fun to see, you know, that they've got these super clear communications um, over these radios in these two completely separate bunkers in two completely different locations. Um, but yeah, and so again, the way that we would resolve this, resolve this is either hopefully there's a base station or there is some kind of connection, but of course there's there's nothing on the radios, right? So there's no there's no hard line out that's connected to an external antenna which can resolve this. And then if she was connected to something similar on the other end, um, is how we would resolve it. But again, suspended belief. They get the job done. They do what they need to do, and the radio was a part of making that happen. So, <laughs> Liana, up. any suspicion on what the what the radios, what the frequencies, what the what they likely might be using? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> I think it's one of those things, right? Like it's, if you think about what it is, it could be using the condition would have to exist that they could use it in an area like through buildings, you know, using between VHF and like using UHF. It, I, I don't know that, it, you know, it, in this instance, if they were using, um, you know, if they were like on base station radios and, and again, and this was connected. Are you asking like how she could talk? Like if she could. Well, be on the moon I'm wondering talking? like you know are they? Can you tell from the from the radios that they have there that we can just see any any suspicion as to oh well they're VHF radios are they UHF radios or maybe it's you know it could be a trunked system or clearly they've spent a lot of money at this park to be able to set something up like yeah, how how could they really, really have made yeah. it possible. Well, well, sure. Chris, if, if hey, Chris, if you look at the uh, the HT that the gentleman has, it's a really short antenna, which probably tells me it's UHF. Hmm. Right, and then uh, the other th on top of that. Sorry about that. I see what you're getting at, Chris. It was just a misunderstanding. Sure. But I think uh, the way that they could make that happen is like we were just talking about is you know, there's not a really believable way to make it happen the way that they're doing it. Um, they'd have to be hardwired somehow, either the HTs or again, a base station into a system and that the two are in places where they can, you know, where the, the, the signal would actually uh, be viable. Uh, so the other thing that they're dealing with, right? I mean, so UHF makes sense because of the terrain that you're dealing with. If you're talking about going across, uh, you know, this, this, this park, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's the, the real thing is, is being hardwired into to a solution. I don't know how she could be on the move and do that. Um, unless again, it was something where inside the bunkers, they forced off something like this and they had a way to, uh, you know, repeat out from a wired base station so that, you know, she could be on her HT. Right. Yeah. It, and I see some, some comments coming into the chat. Some people are suspect are uh, suggesting perhaps they were using a, a DMR hotspot kind of thing. One of the sequences that, that's like, the whole point of this sequence is the power is completely out everywhere. So there's no there's no power going to any communication systems. There's no power going to the security systems, anything. Um, so they're just using 
AHTs at this point to try and communicate. And to Liana's point, there's just kind of no way that that's going to penetrate uh, through what they're what they're doing to be able to make that happen. So super fun. Yeah. Always, that makes always. Sense. Oh. Dan okay. has good comments too. Yeah, that's super fun. Dan has good comments too. I mean, it wouldn't be too dissimilar from, you know, the radio solutions that are used right now, in like subways and underground. Right. All right. Let's, uh, let's go on to the next one. The next one is, uh, I'm going to go over to Scott for this one. And uh, Scott found this movie. This is a movie called High Frequency. And it's uh, 1988, I believe, is the the time frame on this. Scott, you want to do a little a little setup and kind of walk us through a little bit of this, and I'll I'll join in where where it makes sense too. Okay, yeah. Um, so this movie is set um, uh, between two people. One of them is in Maine, and the other person uh, who is at 9,000 feet in the Swiss Alps, and. The, the the person in Maine is a 11 year old boy trying to um, communicate with the world because his dad was at sea and was a lot and was lost at sea as a captain of a ship and so he talks to different ships and all of a sudden he got a hold of this person in um, the Swiss Alps and this this gentleman right here and so they're they're communicating back and forth. And part of the discussion goes on as to what type of antenna um, is, is being used. And so the gentleman in the Alps which is, um, is using a, a very large antenna. And you'll see here the radio that the kid has in Maine is a Drake TR4, which runs from uh, 80 meters to 10 meters. It's an older radio. Um, so this is what's being used there here's a better picture of it and the radio that's being used in um in the, in the alps are these two radios that you see there one of them is an icon um both are uh one's an icon r70 which is a receiver only and if you'll notice the frequency that they're operating on is 2.995 um the radio that the kid has the Drake only drops down to 3.5 or up to 3.5 megahertz. So a little out there. This is a receiver. This is also a, I believe it was a Yesu. And it's also a receiver. He's talking on two receivers. And here's a, a better picture of it as, as well. And the discussion keeps going on as to types of antennas. And as we learn through through where he's at in the lighthouse. And this is where um, Chris can talk a little bit more about the specialized antennas that the kid is using in, in Maine. Yeah, so so they they decide when they, they initially make contact that uh, they need to shift frequencies just a little bit to establish this really good connection. And that really good connection, it turns out, is going to be a frequency of 2.995 megahertz. And they they carry this through the entire movie as to what they're doing. So the, there's all this question in, in the beginning, as, as all hams do when they're on HF, is what what what's your antenna? So the, the guy in Switzerland tells him that he's running an international television station. Uh, it's a receiving station where he's receiving signals out of uh, from satellites and then rebroadcasting them back. Uh, over the land, but he's using this very specialized antenna. It's a 50-foot parabolic dish antenna. Well, if you if you know anything about parabolic dish antennas, they're mostly used for um, for connection to satellites or very long distance, very focused communication. And the way that they work, all of the signals that are coming in get picked up by the dish itself and they are all reflected into a single point. The parabola of the dish itself defines the direction that each of those signals are going to reflect in. Let me uh, pull Scott down for just a little bit here so it's a little bit easier to see all of the 
all the signals here. So all of those signals then come in and focus in on a single point. And that's where the actual antenna portion is where it's receiving the signal. And that either reflects further down into the dish or the receiver is right up in, in that location. It's oftentimes called an LL, LNB uh, at that point. So this type of antenna is highly directional and it's not a very good antenna for doing HF communication. Uh, matter of fact, it's not going to work for HF pretty much at all. And when you start really kind of thinking about some of the challenges, the further challenges that they face, I, I did a little research. I, I went to Everything RF and they have a parabolic reflector antenna calculator that's on there. And so we know that the dish that the guy is using is a 50 foot dish, which is roughly 15 and a quarter meters in diameter. So I plug that in and they came up with a frequency of 2.995 megahertz. So I, I thought, you know, let's, let's kind of see what a best case scenario of this would be. What would, if they're, what if their sequence, if their frequency had been 2.995 gigahertz? Well, that antenna that he's using would have about 51, positive 51 dB of gain. That's pretty good. That would be a very impressive um, boost of signal. Uh, so he would be able to hear and transmit and, and, and do what he needed to to get that signal in. But if you switch the gigahertz here into megahertz, you find out that his gain is negative eight and a half dB. So he's going in the wrong direction of of increasing gain is basically he would just be barely picking up any passive signals that would be coming in because it would just be going into that little L and B at that point. It really would not have uh, any type of impact that's going on there. So the the challenge ends up being out in the Alps. OK, what antenna is he using? And he really does say that, hey, I'm using this parabolic dish antenna. So the next uh, sequence uh, that we're trying to figure out is, OK, well, what is the antenna that the kid is doing? Well, the kid is we, we know the kid is in Maine and we can tell it's summertime. So that also kind of lends us to think about well, what's the frequency that they're using. Um, it's daytime in both uh, in both Maine and in the Alps. So it's got to be kind of uh, early morning for the for the kid in Maine and uh, kind of late afternoon in Switzerland for that. The frequency of that 2.995 megahertz is not going to be very good for long distance communication at that. So we are also suspending a little bit more belief in how they're actually making that connection. So what do we know about the kid's antenna? So we find out that the kid is sitting there. He was at a, at a lighthouse and he's using the lighthouse antenna. Now we start the sequence on this particular shot and we can see the lighthouse antenna that's directly above the cupola here. And this is more than likely just a two meter VHF antenna. So it's probably not that that he's doing the communication on. The next bit of information we see is we see a, a pullback shot of the house. And here we can see a TV antenna. So remember, this is about 1988. This would have been very common for uh, some of the outer islands in Maine to have uh, a TV antenna Yagi set up to be pointing back at the coast. There's another structure here with some sort of a, a vertical antenna. And uh, I think we're meant to believe that this is the antenna that he's probably using, but that is also more than likely not what's gonna not what's going on here as well. We get a pullback shot and we can see the overall sequence of the lighthouse. The cupola is sitting kind of right here in this location. We've got a flagpole off to the side. And uh, this is the little small HF antenna. But one of the key pieces of information that the kid says is they're no longer, he's using the antenna for the lighthouse. And he's able to do that because no one is any, no one's using that antenna any longer. Well, that got me thinking to, okay, what, what antenna likely would this be? So the film is set in the 1980s and more than likely, um, Knowing that the Loran system, which is a long range navigation system that was prevalent uh, in uh, all around the world, but very prevalent for marine navigation. And there's been different versions of this Loran A, Loran B, Loran C. Loran A 
was uh, decommissioned completely in North America in 1980. And so that would have been at the location where the kid was uh, operating, more than likely the antenna station uh, that was being operated. And that Loran A would have been tuned for two frequencies, 1.85 and 1.95 megahertz, both of which would be plausible for being able to jump on an antenna and make connections on the 2.55 megahertz that they're referring to. So let's let's dive in a little bit more into what Loran is. So I, I found this book, here's a, here's a link to it. Um, and the way that Loran worked is that you had these base stations that were set up along the coast at fixed points, and they would ping out uh, sequences at various different times at various different uh, ratios. And receiving stations out on ships in the area could triangulate based on which sequences that they were hearing from which land-based stations. And they could. there were all these charts and there were computers that they could calculate this stuff to figure out where your position and your course was located. And it, it actually worked pretty effectively. However, it was really complicated to be able to, to set up and operate. During World War II, uh, the, the Allies had various different Loran stations that were set up uh, around Europe. And this is what the Allies were using for uh, aerial navigation uh, across uh, the European theater. And you can see the inner line is for one elevation. The outer line was for aircraft flying at another elevation. So this really was a global system that was being used, but it started to get decommissioned uh, in the in the late 70s, it changed over to some of the other systems and other frequencies. So that's why we think pretty much that we're, we're dealing with uh, the Loran A system here. Uh, this is a picture of Vinyl Haven. This is the island in Maine where the kid is uh, supposed to be. And there is, in fact, a lighthouse right down here. Uh, in the southern portion. The kid says when the guy is looking for where are you located, he's due south of Bangor. So there's Bangor up there. And if you come on down due south, there is the island. We've got Portland uh, over here uh, to, the, uh, to the west, a little bit of where the island is. So if we go back even further and we look at the eastern seaboard, and this is again out of that Loran manual, you can see some of the lines that are coming in here. And sure enough, one of these lines are poking up right around here where that lighthouse is going to be. So it's very likely that that is the setup that the kid was using. So what is the antenna? What is uh, the information about that station that uh, we would want to see? If we go into the Loran book, we look at section 3-6, page 87. You can see a full description of what the station likely would have been. Um, the beginning portion of this is really fascinating because it talks about um, a pair of two 100 kilowatt transmitters, four transmitter timers, uh, at least two gasoline or diesel powered generators and additional auxiliary equipment. The entire Loran system, because this was all so focused on marine navigation and, and aerial navigation, uh, and so it, it always had to be up. When, uh, in order to ensure that, the type of equipment was all set up for redundancy. This is very similar to when we've talked about setting up our Windlink gateways or setting up our stations for MCOM, uh, how you would go through thinking about setting up a station in a way to ensure uh, the station is always going to be operational. Uh, it talks about the testing that's done as you switch from one to another. Um, it talks about the diversity that's set up within the, the stations. Down in this portion, it tells us a little bit about the antenna setup um, that's in here. So um, it would have uh, a pair of antennas, one for transmitting, one for receiving. Uh, they would also be isolated. Uh, some of the equipment would be, uh, it says in here, it would be wrapped uh, in a foil or in a, uh, a wire mesh. So that's saying that uh, it was using, they were using Faraday cages to prevent uh, additional stray RF from coming from these very powerful transceivers from being picked up by the receiving antennas. That goes back to our very first sequence where Liana was talking about being inside of the Airstream trailer and it was acting as a Faraday cage. That metal box around it is preventing those wireless signals from coming in. And so that's one of the uh, core setups here uh, inside of the Loran station. For the, for the actual antennas, 
Um, it said they used two. The the um, the one was a was a non-directional. This is their their uh, receiving antenna. It was either a vertical wire or a steel tower of about 110 feet in height, or an inverted L, 55 feet long or so. Oh, I'm sorry. This is the transmitting antenna. Uh, the receiving antenna was usually a single non-directional vertical about 50 feet long. Um, but depending on what the needs were, it also talks about some of these stations would use a beverage antenna, which is a very long horizontal antenna that receives off of the end of the antenna. Um, they're very good, very quiet for, for receiving from very long distances. The challenge with them is that they take up a lot of space. Um, generally, the uh, for this station, a complete living and supply storage quarters must also be provided, meaning that this really is like a full operation. A lighthouse would be an ideal setup for something like this. And therefore, the whole station occupies several acres of of land. So it, again, kind of just reinforces this is more than likely the station that the, the kid is sitting there operating, or at least the antennas that he's been able to, to hook into. And since the whole system has been decommissioned, if those antennas are still in place, it allows them to uh, to jump on and to be able to use that. So kind of a fun, uh, fun little setup there uh, as we walk through some of that information. Uh, let's go over to the next, the 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 last of the films that we're going to talk about. Um, I want to go back to Liana uh, for this one. This is uh, Die Hard, <clears throat> and uh, we have uh, another sequence here uh, for for Die Hard. Um, so um, everyone's favorite Christmas movie, Die Hard. Um, in this movie, uh, as many of you may or may not know, it takes place in uh, an office building mostly. Um, that's where most of the action takes place. Um, and in real life, the tower is called Noct or, or just Noct in real life. In real life, I don't know who owns the building now, but it exists in Los Angeles. It's a 35-story building. And then the movie is called Nakatomi Tower. Um, and I actually didn't look at the radios too much to see what they might be using. The image is pretty dark. Here you see Alan Rickman, and he's the um, he's the bad guy, um, and you know he's he's dealing with the Bruce Willis character, um, and who's trying to um, to uh, to uh, stop him from doing the stuff that he's trying to do. And so when they're talking over the radio, uh, Alan Rickman um, and and his 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 everybody he's on his team. They're talking over radios. They don't know yet that um, that uh, uh, his 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 nemesis has a radio as well, and they he was able to get one from one of one of the guys. You know, he 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 um, he, um, he uh, disables one of the guys. You know, he gets into a fight with them. I can't remember if he killed him or not, but and then he takes his radio. So um, this look like they might be maybe they're the same prop from the Jurassic Park movie because the form factor looks very similar. Uh, obviously, it's an HD with a short antenna. So um, the fun stuff is in this, while they're talking back and forth, again, a lot of, of the office buildings, of course, you can see antennas on the top of them. So we assume there's some kind of antenna system. But again, they're on HT is inside of this 35-story building. And they're talking everywhere from you know the penthouse to uh, the basement or the, the garage or, uh, level, which may or may not be... Uh, uh, also inside, uh, again, super clear communications, but uh, you have Bruce Willis too, who's uh, everywhere from inside, you know, um, elevator, uh, elevator shafts and all of that kind of thing. But uh, to Dan's point is was related to like uh, Metro and we know now like there's a lot of communications that happen with radio over um, in office buildings just like this now. And so it's possible, right? There's infrastructure that exists so that signals can travel through floors. Um, I don't know what the specific setup would have been for this, but of course, obviously, you could have some kind of ability to repeat. Um, and I'm not as familiar with as Scott and uh, and and Chris are with specific models of, of equipment, um, but uh, it's just kind of fun to hear them talking and um, they're uh, they're 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 going back and forth. 
um, throughout this entire movie on these radios, which again, as we know now, is, is entirely possible. Uh, when the movie came out in 1988, I'm sure same thing existed. Uh, there really isn't anything here, I think, to argue with. Um, again, it's just a more fun use of radios um, in an environment where uh, this one's a little, probably one of the more believable ones um, of all of the different setups. All right, cool. Let me bring let me bring everybody back up and kind of go around. Uh, any any other thoughts on some of these before we uh, dive into the into the map? I know we've 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 all sat and we've we've watched a lot we've watched a lot of these sequences. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you look down in the comments or down in the uh, description, I've added links to where you can find. Uh, all of these different segments. If you're hanging around for the after party, we'll actually watch through a lot of these sequences so people can watch the, the full sequences as to what's there. Um, but uh, any other any other kind of thoughts about some of the challenges that have appeared inside of films uh, where, where the portrayal has, has been, especially any of these particular ones? Um, David, I know you had some thoughts on... Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, one of, one of my favorite... Uh, non sequitur radio terms that you see, you know, in TV and movie is over and out, right? Over and out is like the worst, the worst of all possible. And, you know, be, um, you know, you say over, which means, Hey, I'm going to stop talking and listen to you. And then you say out at the same time, which means I am going to go away and leave. So basically you're telling someone I've stopped talking, please talk, but I'm not going to listen. I'm going to leave here right now. Right. And you hear that over and out all the time, over and over and over again. So don't ever use that. Right. Unless you come on my other show and we end that show with that, because that's what we're doing. We're going to stop talking and leave you here to listen. Um, you know, I just think that's funny and classic. And, you know, you see amateur radio or, or other radios in, in TV movie all the time. Um, there's an NCIS uh, episode that they did that, you know, I did another show on that we talked about that, you know, ham radio was a huge part of it. And, you know, they, they paint us out to be preppers and weirdos and psychos and whatever. And we don't. And again, in that, in that particular sequence, there was the same kind of thing. He was talking locally and then far away on the same radio that we knew didn't have like, you know, it wasn't UHF, it was all HF. And are you going to talk locally? No. And microphones not plugged in and nothing in the back there was no antenna so you just you see this stuff over and over grant it's great to pick it up and understand and identify it i'd never try to ruin it for anybody in the moment right because it's the magic of television and movie um but it also is good to you know keep your thinking cap on be aware and observant and and often i try to think well how could i fix this how would i make it work other than plug it in obviously you know, David, in that in the uh, in the high frequency uh, movie that that Scott found, the the very first exchange between the kid and and the guy, mm -hmm. um, the kid's like, oh, this is you know, you're 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 pulling my chain. Like it's there's no way that you're in Switzerland. That's not happening. And he he gets like annoyed at the guy. And he's like over and out. And he literally he reaches over and just turns off his radio and he walks away. He's like, I'm I'm done with with this whole you know conversation at this point um and then comes back and starts engaging and throughout the rest of the the movie one of the things that's kind of interesting how the two of them carry on literally like one of them just like reaches over to the microphone and is like hey danny are you there and he's like yeah of course i'm right here and so no matter the time of day the hour their 2.995 megahertz frequency and their radios are just established and they just work all the time. It's just some of some of it like it. Well, that's nice. Um, Scott, what I other think, thoughts do you have? Oh, go ahead. Liana. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Scott. Uh, no. Um, yeah, that was some of the comments I was going to make. And it's just understanding the capabilities of your equipment and and what is interacting with them, and especially your antennas, um, play a huge role in dealing with uh, the communication aspect of, of all this. Yeah, you... I think um, from, oh, go ahead, Chris. No, no, go ahead. I was gonna say, go ahead. Oh, I was uh, just gonna say, kind of in hindsight for me, like the way that you, um, had the graphic Chris, like, I think that, um, you know, in hindsight, like if I had done that for the clips that I had covered, that would have been like, that would have been nice. Like, here's the setup that we're looking at. Cause we were looking at screenshots 
but then to be able to say here's a potential here are some potential solutions i kind of liked that graphic and so like just something for me going forward is you know i'm kind of new to presenting anything to anybody so uh, i think that would be helpful in the future so as we're talking about it we can talk everything we want and we're seeing screenshots and you know and they have to show we can show the clips but um um, I think that would also just be kind of helpful. Like, what are possible solutions? Like you were saying, it's UHF, it's VHF, um, it's HF, and here's here would be the solution. So I'll have to remember that for next time for myself. Oh, cool. Uh, I see Dan has been able to to join us. Uh, Dan, I'm not sure if you want to add any comments, either let us know in the chat um, or if you would like. Um, I will uh, I will add you on here. Dan has been out on assignment, uh, but let's see if uh, if he wants to jump in here with with any comments. He is certainly welcome to. Hi all. Um, no, I've I've enjoyed what you've presented, and um, you know, there's so many examples uh, of stuff. I, I I did a check in, and I noted in that one of my favorite uses of radio um, was in a Father Knows Best episode. And Bud got a shortwave radio receiver and was listening. And he started hearing this family aboard a uh, cabin cruiser um, having a day out. And as it turned out, the family described the family to somebody. And it was a family just like the Anderson family. And um, But then the weather started getting bad. And the the ultimate crux of the thing was... Um, no one could hear um, their calls for help. Uh, the Coast Guard was there, uh, but couldn't hear them very well. And they talked about things like skip. And it was very interesting, the technical detail they went into in trying to describe this. But ultimately, the Anderson family realized, we've got a telephone. We can call for help because at this point, the family is in desperate need of help, the They've lost power. They're about to, to go under. And, of course, the Coast Guard gets the information at the last minute and gets there and saves the family. But uh, always has been one of my favorite episodes uh, because it involved radio, and I've been fascinated with radio since I was a kid. You know, Dan, you, you're kind of going through that that detail of, of how the – the radio communication was being explained it it reminded me as i as i was helping to as starting to prepare for this for this episode one of the resources that i that i found as we were trying to figure out scott and i have been back and forth uh for the past couple of days like trying to figure out just analyzing and analyzing and analyzing at a high frequency sequence trying to figure out what was going on what was the antenna that the kid actually was using and this this resource this loran uh, long range navigation book. This was published in 1948. Uh, it's available. There's a there's a link here that you can get to. I'll also put it in the in the chat and I'll put it in the uh, uh, on YouTube so that you can get to it as well. This manual has an enormous amount of information about how HF operates, how to operate an HF station, um, how all the different types of communication over HF operated because this was this critical navigation system that was all based on HF radio. And so all of the operators that were around the world had to know how to do this uh, quite well. So it, it just, it, as I got in and I haven't read enough of this manual yet, but I really want to get in and read some more of it so I can uh, see more information about that. So uh, with that, hey, let me go ahead and uh, pull everybody down here real quick, and I'm going to jump into doing the like kind of map everybody out here real quick. Thanks, Liana, for or somebody for pulling those folks down, and uh, let me jump over to the walk up here. I'm going to do one more quick check of the Winlink check-in. So if you haven't had a chance to send in your Winlink check-in, go ahead and do so now. Let me start that again. See if any more have come in. It looks like all of them have come in. We'll do one more check here. And looks like we've gotten everybody. Next, I'm going to go over here. I'm going to click on the map icon. 
I'm going to click the little drop down here. Make sure we're selected to the current version of the form. Current version of the form uh, in the mapping shows as Winlink check dash NV5. So I've received all of these forms as, uh, as you guys sent those in. And I can click on that and then hit the display map. Um, now I'm going to go up and I'm going to make sure in my filters, I'm only going to look at the current 24 hours. So this is going to be anybody who has sent in their WinLink check-in within the last 24 hours. We'll go ahead and hit save. And so we'll see uh, just those pins. I'll blow that map out to full screen and we'll zoom all the way out to get an overview of all of the stations who have sent in their WinLink check-ins. And let's start down here with uh, Terry, ZL1HOG, joining us from New Zealand. Uh, we also have Victor Kilo 2, Sierra Kilo Yankee, joining us from Australia. Hey, thanks a lot for joining us from uh, from the Southern Hemisphere. Really appreciate that, guys. Uh, we also have uh, Sierra Mike 7, Yankee Tango November, and this looks like uh, Roland joining us from, from Germany. Uh, love to see that uh, folks joining in from from around the world. Let me zoom in a little bit. I'm going to right click on the on my map here, and that allows me to right click and pan in order to pan the map around. We'll continue here. We've got uh, Victor Echo Three Yankee X Ray joining us up here in uh, Canada. We'll come on down here and we'll roll over some of the stations that are here. We've got uh, Lloyd there in the in the Carolinas, uh, November eight L. And so like JLJ uh, stations down here in Florida, kind of roll over several of these to make sure we've got everybody. Hey, King joining us there. Um, stations here in the southern, it looks like Ed joining us. And uh, sorry, I got to learn everybody's names with their call signs. I'm uh, trying to pick as many of these up as I can as I kind of roll over to make sure we can uh, call everybody out. Let me zoom into the Pacific Northwest a little bit. Got a couple of stations up here and several here in the, uh, there's Bill joining us. Thanks a lot for joining us, Bill. Come on down a little further. Uh, looks like a station here in Salt Lake City. They uh, appear to be maybe in Heber. Uh, N7KRJ joining us in that area. A couple of stations here in the Vegas area, several here in Northern California, out here in the Piedmont area, and in the Bay area, joining us in there. And let me go ahead and jump, come down to Southern California. We've got a few more stations that are in here. Make sure everybody can see that we got your check-ins that have been coming in from everywhere. So great, thanks a lot for, uh, for everybody sending all of those check-ins, we really, we really love seeing all of those, and and it's good practice to make sure that you're able to send in your Winlink check-in every week. Make sure your station's working, everything is operating as it should be. Let me uh, bring everybody back up, and we'll just quickly go around for any uh, closing thoughts that folks may have. Let's see if uh, Dan's got his camera on. Scott, always takes a long time getting all this done. Oh, there we go. Everybody's in there. Great. Um, Liana, you're our guest for uh, for today. Thanks so much for, for joining us. Uh, N6WH, any closing thoughts from, from you for today? Uh, no, thanks for, for the invite. Um, I hope uh, everybody enjoyed. Um, it was a little bit different note than the little stuff that the, the four you typically do. So thanks for allow, allowing me uh, to play around a little bit. And uh, yeah, it was fun. Thanks. Nice. Uh, David, W0DHG, what kind of closing thoughts you got today? Yeah, I think this was a was a fun pivot on, you know, on what we really do. And I think, you know, it, it's great for everybody to go out in the world and all the things that they do to look to see what's what what would be real, what wouldn't be real in these, you know, things that you see. And often I would say, try to figure out what would make it work? How could it work? What's the equipment that makes sense in those situations? Because it'll help you solve other problems as you go through your amateur radio or other radio uh, career in life. Thanks. Dan, NR6V. Well, I think, you know, sometimes having knowledge is a curse because you, you sit down to watch a movie and enjoy it. 
and the discrepancies drive you nuts. And it's really hard to sit back and go back into that viewer mode and say, okay, I, I suspend d d disbelief here. It's, it's a movie and enjoy it. But, uh, you know, uh, being from law enforcement, I see that all the time when I watch any kind of cop show, uh, just all the things that are just totally not realistic, but radio is the same thing. But I think you guys pick some great, great things to highlight and, and, uh, some explanations and, and, uh, uh, I was, I was a viewer this time, not a participant really. And I enjoyed it. So thanks for doing that. Excellent. Scott, KM6 RFB. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, um, kind of like what Dan said, um, I've been kicked out of the room numerous times because um, <laughs> of um, quit tearing apart the movie. It's just a movie <laughs> and let it be. But in reality, um, I have a hard time as well from the fire service watching a lot of these fire shows and going, yeah, no, not going to happen. Um, think outside the box. Don't let the box hold you in to what you can and can't do. Because a lot of times your solution comes from outside the box. And, and I know Chris and I have experienced that firsthand. Uh, and we keep referring back to the, the IMSA exercise in Ventura. And, and we had to go outside the box to realize what how do we make this work? And so you, utilizing those tools in your toolbox and don't be afraid to try something that may, may seem, seem unconventional. You know, as I, I as I was preparing for for this episode, one of the things that I really enjoyed doing was going back and starting to really think, where have I seen radio communications used in TV and films? How was it used? What did they get right? What did they get wrong? Um, and what are some of the things? Uh, one one of the, the one of the topics that kept coming up was was Star Trek. How, how are communications portrayed in Star Trek and what are they done? Star Trek has been one of the shows that has constantly pushed the envelope with science fiction. And a lot of times when people think, oh, well, that'll never happen. People have been thinking about this stuff now for several decades. And that is the, the whole fantasy world of Star Trek has been creeping more and more as people start to try and figure out, well, how might that be possible? How could we make something like that happen? And watching through a lot of these sequences made me think of a lot of those as well, thinking about the, the sequences in Jurassic Park. Well, how, how could they make communication work within uh, the, you know, having, having handheld radios for the operators that are having to run all over an island going into a lot of different areas? Well, surely they would have thought through having to set up additional infrastructure. How, how would, uh, you know, I love seeing movies where uh, they, they take a topic such as high frequency, high frequency radio, HF radio communication, something that I've really gotten into to being able to use, and they build an entire story around it. And while they don't get everything right in it, they they have sprinkled in so much stuff that for for those of us who are really into this sort of thing, being able to go in and start dissecting it almost becomes a, a, a really fun challenge in and of itself. Um, so I really encourage everybody to go back and watch some of these films again, check them out and, and have a lot of fun. If you found the information that we're, we put out there helpful, be sure to like the video on YouTube. Um, leave us a comment. Let us know what sequences or, or movies, TV shows that you found that you really enjoy that use radio. Go ahead and leave that in the comments and we'll, we'd love to engage with that on, on our YouTube channel. And if you find the information really helpful, consider going on to wavetalkers.com and use the Bias Look Coffee link and, and help uh, keep everything running, all the infrastructure going with that. So with that, uh, if you're here inside of the Zoom, please hang around for the after party. Uh, we'll play through some of the sequences so you can see the, the full sequences after we've now talked about them a little bit. And um, if you'd like to join us inside of the after party, be sure to go to Wave Talkers, click on the join us link on any of the pages. It's down near the bottom. We only send out one email a, uh, a week and we send in the link so that you can join us for those as well. So with that, we'll say 7-3 to everyone and uh, we'll catch you next week. So thanks a lot, everyone. And rough.